Before you listen, if you enjoy the stories and want to hear more, then please consider subscribing. Most of you listening aren't subscribed, so please take this time to subscribe. Turn on notifications so you'll never miss a story and be the first to hear. You'll also be supporting me. Thank you. Dating hats were supposed to open up more possibilities for meeting someone special. But for me, one seemingly innocent right swipe brought obsession into my life and showed that darkness can hide behind even the most charming faces. When Matt's profile first popped up, his great looks combined with shared interests in hiking, live music, and craft beer immediately caught my eye. We started messaging within the app, and I was quickly charmed by his witty banter and easy flowing conversation that seemed to click effortlessly. After messaging back and forth for about a week, we finally made plans to meet up for dinner and drinks on that next Saturday night. When I arrived at the restaurant and saw Matt standing there waiting for me, handsome just like his photos, I noticed he also had an irresistible confidence and charisma that attracted me instantly. He acted like the perfect gentleman all evening, holding doors, asking thoughtful questions. I truly felt like I had hit the dating jackpot. The next few weeks after that seemingly perfect first date were absolute bliss. Matt enthusiastically took me on incredibly fun and creative dates all over the city, exploring new restaurants, concerts, museums. We genuinely never ran out of new things to laugh about and bond over. This really seemed to be the storybook fairy tale start to a relationship that I had always hoped for but never actually found. But then gradually, very small red flags started popping up here, and then when I really looked back critically, Matt would get clingy if I didn't reply immediately to a text or had to delay our nightly phone call. He was increasingly wanting to know my entire schedule and whereabouts at all times and he insisted adamantly on picking me up and dropping me off absolutely everywhere we went together, not liking me to drive myself. At first I tried to brush off his quirks as normal new relationship excitement and eagerness, but the vibe was growing subtly yet increasingly unsettling. It only took another week or two for his behavior to cross firmly over the line from eager attentiveness into overly controlling, possessive, and borderline paranoid actions. Why didn't I feel the need to get coffee and chat with a new male friend from work? Why wasn't I home at my usual exact time after running errands by myself? My stomach nodded with anxiety when he started randomly showing up just to say hi at my yoga studio after class, my office on days we didn't already have plans, or suspiciously finding me at the grocery store when I knew I hadn't told him I'd be there. It became painfully clear that my personal space and independence were vanishing, with my activities and relationships now being closely monitored. When I gently tried explaining that we needed to take some steps back, and I required a little less contact and togetherness moving forward, the dark, ugly side of Matt emerged that he had so skillfully hidden away during our honeymoon period. He absolutely bombarded me with desperate emotive please, please not to leave him. Left rambling, tearful voicemails at all hours, text essay bombardments about how we were meant to be together forever, and I just needed to embrace this. The initial charm and charisma I had found so attractive had completely vanished, replaced by manipulation tactics to get me to stay despite my misgivings. I finally made the difficult choice to stand firm and break things off definitively with Matt for the sake of self-preservation and my own mental well-being. But instead of accepting it, that fateful choice tragically only seemed to trigger Matt's frightening irrational obsession into overdrive. Suddenly he was quite literally everywhere I went lurking in the lobby outside my apartment when I left for work, popping up in the coffee shop near my office, parked outside my office building long after he knew I had already left for the day. No matter where I found myself, he would coincidentally turn up within minutes, saying we were destined soulmates and I just needed to stop fighting it. His delusional claims about our relationship worried me deeply and set my self-protection instincts fully on high alert. I directly told him he was not to contact or attempt to approach me again in any manner, or I would be forced to take legal action. Changing my phone number initially provided some temporary relief, but Matt always managed to eventually circle back around with new email addresses or social media accounts, or intercept me directly in person when I was out vulnerable and alone. He clearly had zero intent of respectfully leaving me in peace to move on solo from our defunct relationship. Weeks of constantly hiding in plain sight, endlessly altering my daily routines, Letting friendships deteriorate to protect their safety too did nothing to truly shake Matt's obsessive hold on me. 
The charming prince I had envisioned at first had rapidly morphed into the villain, the predator silently hunting me wherever I went. And villains don't just casually let the princess freely and easily escape their grasp and cursed castle without an epic fight. In desperation, I finally went to the police for guidance, safety precautions, and about filing for a restraining order. But they informed me that in their eyes, this situation still amounted to nothing more than a messy romance simply gone wrong between two private individuals. They said there was likely nothing they could concretely do preemptively to intervene unless Matt made overly threatening moves against me or specific loved ones. I realized I was essentially still on my own when it came to handling his irrational fixation. Forced to find ways to evade someone twice my size who could easily physically overpower me if he tried taking me somewhere against my will. This terrifying and dizzying game of cat and mouse went endlessly on with Matt always barely one step behind my every complex maneuver to stealthily evade him. I jumped at every sound, withdrew from spending time with friends in case he was closely monitoring my social media activity for clues. He had utterly stolen my life, freedoms, and peace of mind. Finally, after what felt like an eternity of this, Matt's highly alarming and unhinged behavior in public was caught clearly on security tape by a concerned store manager who contacted the authorities. A restraining order was hastily issued, but it still did little to deter Matt's singular obsessive mission to have me as his own. In his utterly warped mind, I was his purpose in life, his muse, his everything, and he was clearly not about to just let me slip away and ghost him so easily. College parties were supposed to just be a place for having harmless fun, meeting new people, and blowing off study stress for a night. But for me, one fateful encounter at a crowded off-campus bash ended up leading to the single scariest night of my life. It served as a sobering reminder that true danger can easily lurk right under the guise of the most normal and the disarming of friendly faces. My outgoing roommate Meg had managed to convince me to reluctantly leave the dorm and check out this huge party off-campus one Friday night, enthusiastically promising it was just what I needed to take a much-deserved study break after an intensely stressful week. Arriving fashionably late with a bubbly drink already in hand courtesy of Meg, I tentatively surveyed the lively crowded party scene, feeling both slightly thrilled and majorly outside my comfort zone. But I knew she was right. I needed to have some actual fun for once and let loose. That's the moment when I first spotted him from clear across the packed living room, the cute, creppy-looking guy chatting and laughing with a group of friends. When our eyes happened to meet through the crowd, he gave me a warm, borderline flirtatious smile and immediately started maneuvering his way through the crowd to approach me directly. We had never been introduced before, but I could instantly tell by his beeline in my direction that he was definitely interested in getting to know me better. I quickly straightened my new skirt and adjusted my top, suddenly feeling self-conscious and secretly hoping I looked alluring enough. He came right up and smoothly introduced himself as Eric. Practically having to shout over the blaring rap music, he made casual small talk about recognizing me from his intro psych class this semester. The conversation flowed easily between us as we organically discovered mutual acquaintances from campus clubs, overlapping circles of friends, and a bunch of surprisingly similar interests and taste in music. I was honestly thrilled and flattered when, after another song or two, he worked up the courage to ask for my phone number and propose we seriously meet up together sometime very soon outside of this party. After all, I had come here tonight hoping for some carefree fun with friends, and maybe even the possibility of romantic potential if I was lucky enough. And that exciting possibility now seemed to be falling right into my lap. Eric eventually drifted back off into the crowd to rejoin his nearby pack of male friends, but kept smiling over at me flirtatiously from afar and catching my eye, clearly enamored. I smiled right back, absentmindedly sipping my drink while I chatted casually with Meg, giddy and energized with a newfound anticipation and promise this night now held. When my ever-social roommate inevitably wandered off yet again, this time eagerly following some new potential crush prospect, Eric gallantly swooped right back in to keep me happy company during my otherwise solo moments in the crowded, pulsing party environment. I was admittedly thrilled when he handed me a fresh, full solo cup from the counter, cheerfully clinking it against my nearly empty one. I contentedly drank while listening intently to his entertaining stories and anecdotes, not wanting our lively conversation to have to end. 
But after laughing together uproariously at one silly story from his freshman dorm experiences, I absently went to take another long sip from my cup, only to find it bizarrely empty once again already. The icy sweet liquid felt refreshing and instantly cooling against my throat as I moved in closer to be able to properly hear every word he said over the pulsing pee of the music. But then something exceedingly strange suddenly started happening only minutes after taking that first gulping sip. Eric's animated words began to sound oddly muffled and blurred, becoming nearly impossible to decipher or follow along with as he spoke. The lively room also seemed to tilt and sway dizzyingly each time I instinctively moved my head or tried adjusting my posture. Panic alarm bells faintly began ringing in the foggy recesses of my brain that something was most definitely not at all right here tonight. My legs buckled as the floor seemed to inexplicably rush up to meet me without warning, but Eric's strong grip on my arm caught me firmly just before I sunk fully to the ground, carefully lowering me onto the nearest empty couch amidst the revelry. My limbs already felt lean and disconnected, their movements sluggish and disconnected. I glimpsed Eric leaning over me where I lay incapacitated on the sofa, calmly talking and nodding to another unknown guy who had subtly materialized and now partially blocked me from view. Their words were entirely incoherent and drowned out by the blaring nearby speakers, but some silent transcation definitely seemed to occur between the shadowy figures hovering over my limp form. Icy dread nodded in the pit of my stomach when I felt more than saw Eric slide his hands under my now helpless deadweight body and lift me towards the staircase behind us, saying something inaudible into my ear. I knew intrinsically that if Eric got me alone upstairs right now in this condition, it would most assuredly end in my assault, or even my death. By some miracle, pure animalistic survival adrenaline suddenly surged within me right then, granting me temporary cognitive control of my unwieldy, numb limbs once again. With physical strength unexpectedly borrowed from the sheer magnitude of my primal fear response, I successfully slid my limp body forcefully from Eric's loose grasp onto the floor. Pain bloomed in my knees and hip bones as dead weight met thin carpet below, but I hardly registered it consciously. Chaos immediately erupted around me as I began shouting as best as I could in feeble incoherent pleas for Meg or anyone else who knew me here, while this Eric cursed under his breath and reached determinedly for me again. My savior finally arrived in the heroic form of two hulking protective brothers from my psych class who had overheard the rapidly escalating commotion nearby and immediately intervened on my behalf. They hastily carried me outside to safety amidst the turmoil. The other brother returned grim-faced to the house party shortly after to deal directly with Eric, who he confirmed did indeed have illegal date rape drugs on his person, as well as clearly sinister intentions for me tonight. Later on at the emergency room, once I had been stabilized and some time had passed, grim details began emerging of just how elaborate and carefully premeditated Eric's underhanded scheme to make me a defenseless victim truly had been. The strategic separate drugging of my replacement drink after my original vodka was purposefully emptied. The recruiting of a normally trustworthy seeming accomplice who could help slip me away upstairs unnoticed. The likely assault or even possibility of my death at the hands of someone I had willingly viewed as a potential romantic partner. Anything could have happened had my adrenaline fight response not kicked in when it did. I never expected a one-time blind date to open the door for a predator to enter my world. But that's the power of superficial perception. We see only the charming facade someone shows us, not the darkness that facade conceals. Brian seemed perfectly nice, normal, and relationship-worthy on paper when my friend Kim first set us up. He was cute, owned his own home, date at a cozy little Italian restaurant downtown. The conversation flowed a bit stiffly at first as we felt each other out, but soon he had me laughing and engaging more, eyes sparkling as he asked thoughtful questions about my job, family, and interests. The whole drive home, Already looking forward to seeing him again soon, he quickly called me the next day to ask if he could take me out that weekend, an offer I cheerfully accepted, thinking the romantic interest was clearly mutual. But life quickly got very busy for me that week. Between an avalanche of new projects and deadlines at work and two out-of-town weddings to attend solo, I ended up gently calling Brian to cancel our second date, 
insisting we could totally reschedule the following week when my calendar calmed down. He sounded disappointed but understanding on the phone. Then days predictably turned into weeks as I adjusted to my new hectic schedule and Brian gradually faded from my conscious mind entirely. Until over a month later when I unexpectedly walked into my favorite local coffee shop downtown before work and immediately spotted a familiar face smiling over at me from a small corner table in the back. Brian enthusiastically waved me over the second we made eye contact. He warmly apologized for coming on too strong before, attributing it to just really liking me. Flattered by his persistence, I found myself agreeing to finally have that second date soon without hesitation. But something seemed slightly off this time to make my innate alarm bells tingle. His suspiciously specific knowledge of my favorite coffee order, when I certainly hadn't mentioned that detail before, was the first red flag. And when I often did mention being away a lot for weddings and work trips lately, he casually and confidently commented on the two specific cities I had visited and the tropical locale of the destination wedding I'd just returned from. Definitely an odd coincidence or lucky guess, or was it? I tried brushing it off as just a stellar memory, but doubt crept in. Things only got more eerie and concerning from there as we tentatively resumed contact. More and more innocent little remarks slipped out from Brian that casually revealed he somehow knew all these minute private details about where I had been and what I had been up to for these past few weeks we were out of contact. Things no virtual stranger should actually be privy to or mentioning. My skin crawled at the dawning realization that he must have been closely, perhaps even obsessively, following and tracking my daily movements in secret this whole time for his own hidden reasons. I immediately called my skeptical friend Kim, who set us up, and shared my escalating concerns over Brian's boundary-crossing behavior. She solemnly agreed that this weird, intimate knowledge of my weeks away seemed like a troubling, unexplained red flag coming out of left field that she certainly had never witnessed from him before. I felt immensely validated that this was not just my own paranoia flaring up. His actions were objectively disturbing and pointed towards someone no longer harmless. Avoiding any further contact with Brian as much as realistically possible became my number one priority and mission. My everyday routes to and from work suddenly changed. Social media was made fully private. I kept vigilant watch for any glimpses of him nearby wherever I went. But occasional brief sightings of him linger like an ominous shadow, always playing innocent if we happen to lock eyes. It became disturbingly clear that for reasons only he could fully comprehend, he was intentionally keeping me under constant surveillance. Weeks of constantly looking nervously over my shoulder everywhere, only going out in groups, and keeping pepper spray handy in my bag at all times quickly took an immense psychological and emotional toll. And still somehow his lurking presence permeated so much of my previously carefree life. No matter how careful I was, I could always subliminally feel unseen eyes tracking me, like a laser locked onto target. This exhausting chess game of evasion clearly could not go on indefinitely. In desperation, I finally went to the local police station to plead for guidance, protection, and try filing for some kind of restraining order. However, they informed me regretfully that in the eyes of the law, no explicit threatening crimes had technically been committed here yet by someone simply frequenting the very same public places or driving on the same streets. With no overt harassment or harm done, it was still insufficient evidence to legally justify intervention and restrictions through a court-ordered restraining order. Not accepting defeat that easily, I got clever and creative about finding concrete proof of Brian's alarming obsession with me. A close friend's brother happened to work security at my large office building downtown, so I convinced him to discreetly request copies of all lobby and parking garage surveillance tapes from the past month, saying it was just part of some routine staff training they were conducting. Sure enough, once we reviewed the footage, it became undeniably evident. There was Brian skulking around at odd hours or days I wasn't there, walking straight up to my parked car or desk on my floor without an ounce of hesitation or innocent confusion, proving he knew exactly where to find these locations. I finally had the first solid, indisputable proof needed to build a case against his illegal stalking. Confronting Brian directly to try getting him to stop was admittedly an enormous risk, but I felt prepared. In a public local park with plenty of weekend witnesses around, I purposely called him over and aggressively called him out for following me both in person and digitally for weeks, demanding in no uncertain terms that he cease all contact and surveillance of me immediately 
or I'd probably be taking legal and police action against him. Predictably, he feigned utter confusion at my hostility and accusations, playing the victim role by claiming we were old friends just harmlessly catching up. But he also made enough thinly veiled verbal threats about me regretting this day that I knew I had him. He wasn't as slick as he thought. The local police finally seemed to take me much more seriously the second time I came armed with concrete video evidence, testimony about our exchange, and a clear escalation of his erratic behavior. I urgently pressed for it and was granted a credible restraining order in record time, which officers then personally delivered to a fuming Brian with stern warnings to forever seize all forms of contact with me. When I first met Alyssa, her alluring aura of mystery and slight detachment intrigued me. She was undeniably beautiful, smart, and effortlessly funny, but remained tight-lipped about her past and tended to subtly deflect or steer conversations away any time the topic where she came from was brought up. I figured she had just had a difficult upbringing or bad breakup and enthusiastically dove into a passionate whirlwind romance. But strange occurrences and roadblocks that kept cropping up around me soon revealed that her reticence to be transparent hid a much darker secret side than I ever could have expected. The first exhilarating few months together were pure bliss. We just had natural chemistry that worked seamlessly together. Endless nights were spent cuddled up talking for hours and hours into the early morning. But any time our long conversations ever wandered too close to her childhood, family and friends, or past relationships, she skillfully pivoted the focus elsewhere or made excuses to end the discussion altogether. My curiosity was definitely piqued as to why and how such an undeniable catch like her was still mysteriously single at her age. But Alyssa always insisted convincingly that she simply hadn't found that special right guy yet who really understood her. Until now, supposedly. Her reason seemed believable and reassuring enough, and I genuinely didn't want to come off as nosy or ruin things by prying too much too soon. But slowly over the next several months, increasingly odd and ominous things just kept happening in and around the periphery of my formerly uneventful, drama-free life. Things like my car tires being violently slashed right after a heated argument where she stormed out. Having a near catastrophic accident during our regular Sunday hike on an isolated mountain trail that I later realized had been subtly sabotaged. Whispers floating back to me about spotting Alyssa of getting cozy and flirty with other random men though the rumors always suspiciously dried up instantly any time I tried investigating them further. At first I tried chalking all the bizarre events up to extreme isolated coincidences and petty jealousy over our passion. But soon, the unsettling incidents and interferences in my life became far too uncomfortably frequent and predictable to continue brushing off or ignoring. My gut instinct was screaming that something about these occurrences felt coordinated, pointed, intentional, Someone was deliberately engineering chaos and adversity to control and cue on edge. When I finally worked up the courage to directly confront Alyssa with my concerns one night, her fiery, indignant, knee-jerk reaction to being questioned and accused only amplified and validated my worst creeping fears about her. She snarled at me for supposedly inventing such absurd connections and paranoia where none existed, insisting I was the flawed one who needed help. But in my heart, I knew the steadily accumulating clues and patterns could no longer be overlooked or chalked up as random. She was clearly trying to hide and bury something supremely dark and volatile from her past at all costs. I started discreetly digging for any crumbs of real, concrete answers about who she truly was and where she really came from, despite her continued vehement attempts to try distracting me instead with impromptu over-the-top romantic gestures and exotic trips. Extensive public records searches turned up infuriatingly inconclusive, but one-on-one -on -one interviews with a few of her scattered former neighbors and acquaintances helped gradually paint a far more unsettling picture of her trail of broken relationships, emotional carnage, and the wave of misfortunes and tragedies she always left suspiciously in her wake. It became impossible to deny any longer that she had likely been skipping town to town just barely one step ahead of detection, to escape ever having to take accountability for the patterns of harm and darkness that seemed to follow wherever she went and whoever she got involved with. I had fallen hard for a perfect polished facade and persona that had been carefully crafted by her to mask the damaging truth of who she actually was deep down. 
of course outright accusing her directly of deliberate wrongdoing or evil based on my suspicions would only immediately put me at immense risk I wasn't prepared for. So I pretended continued ignorance of her secrets for the time being while discreetly but urgently taking tangible steps to safeguard and protect myself from what I now knew she was capable of. But Alyssa was far too intuitive and cunning. She sensed the slight shift and withdrawal in me almost right away. Her once so sweet and tender facade rapidly melted away, revealing menacing glimpses of the raging, obsessively possessive monster that had been hidden just below the surface all along. I knew implicitly that I needed to strategically remove myself fully and permanently from her clutches sooner rather than later if I wanted to have any hope of escaping unscathed. Just as expected, Alyssa resisted vehemently when I finally made moves to definitively end our relationship for good. She alternated between desperate pleading and weepiness one minute, and thinly veiled threats, the next about all the ways she had, taken care of me and fixed my life in the time we'd been together. In her warped mind, leaving her was simply not an acceptable option on the table after all she convinced herself she had done for me. As her behavior vacillated wildly between violently unhinged and uncomfortably saccharine, I raced frantically against the clock to finalize my escape plan undetected. The summer I turned 17, I was desperately craving freedom from rules and adventure outside of my sheltered suburban bubble. So against all my straight-laced parents' wishes, I started recklessly sneaking around to meet up with Jesse, the stereotypical dangerous, tattooed bad boy from the gritty part of town that all of my friends gossipingly warned me about. What began as harmless adolescent fun and rebellion soon devolved into a toxic situation I'm lucky I managed to barely escape unscathed. At first, Jesse introduced me to an exciting, gritty world that felt light years beyond the scope of my safe neighborhood upbringing. We'd take thrilling rides along dark back roads on his motorcycle at crazy speeds, the wind whipping my hair as I clung to his waist. He brought me to crowded house parties on the wrong side of town where the booze and drugs flowed freely and dangerously among edgy older crowds I had always somewhat envied. After years of flute lessons, student council meetings, and college prep obsession, I became utterly intoxicated by the escapist surge of perceived danger and reckless freedom that came with being Jess's girl. My anxious weekly check-in dinners with my doting but overprotective parents suddenly seemed almost laughably pedestrian and prudish compared to how Jesse and his crew were out there living each day and night with such thrilling, untethered abandon. I felt like Jess's influence had finally provided the key to unlock the bold, adventurous, mature side of myself that had always been locked away by my uptight upbringing. The illicit rush I got from breaking all my parents' rigid rules was my secret addiction. But as we got further drawn into the daily partying scene with his sketchy friends, Jess's underlying behaviors gradually began to reveal themselves as troubling and controlling when he was drunk or high. Worrying hints of a violent temper emerged more frequently, though we always downplay the bloody fights and constant drama surrounding him as just stupid squabbles that unfairly kept following him around, never his fault. And as the weeks passed in a blur, the hardcore partying and drug use progressed from what felt like harmless buzzed weekends to me needing stronger substances just to function day to day and not be crippled by withdrawals and depression. When I weekly tried half-heartedly to dial back on the 24-7 drug use and 5 a.m. nights to preserve some shred of normalcy, Jesse would pressure and coerce me relentlessly to keep it up. He'd say ominously that riding out the highs together was the only way we can really bond and that I was his ride-or-die girl, not some lame poser. I made excuse after excuse to start avoiding him more, only to have Jesse react unpredictably each time with either manipulation and guilt trips, or outright raging threats about needing to grow up and get away from my parents' influence for good. It finally hit me like a freight train that Jesse ultimately didn't actually love me as I once deluded myself into believing. To him, which is his wide-eyed pawn to easily control and mold as proof of his power, while using me as a means to also triangulate tension with my traditional straight-laced parents who he despised. I'd gotten myself drawn by the promise of danger and novelty into a toxic fantasy relationship I knew deep down was unsustainable. So late one night, I hastily packed a bag and snuck off secretly to show up crying and disoriented on my parents' front doorstep, finally coming completely clean to them through sobs about the months of reckless partying, 
drinking, drug use, and sneaking around with a boy I knew they hated. Despite their monumental disappointment in my behavior, I could also see profound relief wash over them at simply having me safely home again. Their priority was clearly making sure I was in one piece, which far overshadowed any lectures they wanted to give. I just knew I needed to get out of Jess's manipulating grip for good before I lost myself completely. At first, after I went no contact, Jess had blew up my phone at all hours with profuse apologies and desperate pleas not to abandon him now that I was the only steady, non-sketchy person left in his life. But when I remained firm and unmoved by his claims to want to change, the messages rapidly turned into unhinged, raging threats about all the ways he would get back at me if I tried to cut him fully out of my life. He said he still had tons of dirt on me that he would have no problem telling my family or even the police if I betrayed him after all we'd been through together. The terrorizing calls and texts poured in day and night. Terrified of total exposure and the ramifications, I stayed miserably mute for days, racking my brain for ways I could try appeasing Jesse enough to keep him placated and silent. I knew the damning details he held over me could completely ruin my future reputation and relationship with my family for least. He knew exactly how much power my fear gave him, and he continued reveling in maintaining his twisted control over me. But after endless anxiety attack-filled nights, I finally decided I flat-out refused to be successfully blackmailed and manipulated forever by this poisonous former relationship-turned-hostage situation. Mustering unknown courage I didn't realize I had, I decided to preemptively confess the entire sordid story of what I had hidden the past few months to my parents myself and begin facing whatever music and consequences came as a result. They were understandably shocked and outraged at first by the deceptions, but ultimately assured me that their priority was getting me professional help for substance issues, not blaming or punishing me while I was down. When I first met Victor as a foreign exchange student in my college economics class junior year, I was positive I had found my intellectual and romantic soulmate. But after rushedly marrying him so he could stay in the country, his abrupt permit disappearance made me realize too late that I had been callously conned and used in the cruelest way possible. From our very first study session together in the campus library, Victor and I were inseparable. He just seemed to immediately get me intellectually and emotionally in a way no one else ever had. His exotic accent and thrilling stories of his homeland enthralled me as we effortlessly spoke about art, values, and the meaning of life for hours on end. Back in his sparse dorm after sessions, we'd stay up all night whispering and giggling together beneath the blankets like young kids at a sleepover rather than hooking up. His patience and disinterest in pressuring physical intimacy is what ultimately earned my full trust and devotion. Once comfortable, Victor embraced my family and culture with open arms wooing everyone with his impeccable old-fashioned manners, humor, and charm. My parents and siblings adored him nearly as much as I did, welcoming him as one of our own. He seemed to integrate himself into our lives and traditions absolutely effortlessly. After graduating college together, we decided to get a place just for the two of us nearby. However, with his student visa set to expire in a matter of months, unless we married, Victor would be forced to return to his country permanently. But given how strong our relationship still felt after two years of him proving his dedication, my pure love for and faith in our future was unwavering. Despite my protective family's lingering minor concerns, after much reflection I accepted his proposal, confident that legal commitment was the obvious natural next step for us. The day of our small civil ceremony came right before the visa deadline. Looking into each other's teary eyes as we exchanged vows, Victor emotionally gushed about how eternally lucky he was to have found me, the only woman who truly knew his soul. He promised to devote the rest of his days to loving me faithfully and fiercely. I had zero hesitations or doubts as I confidently signed the pivotal paperwork sponsoring his new permanent green card status. I thought we had overcome all obstacles together and finally secured our fairy tale love story. At first, normal life for us newlyweds resumed even sweeter and more cozy than ever before. We took an epic celebratory honeymoon vacation touring the coast with my exceedingly generous parents' help, getting caught up in marital bliss. Victor's public displays of affection and focus on me intensified to an almost uncomfortable degree. Every moment, the aura of our future together radiated with hope and romantic promise. But upon returning home from the trip, 
Victor became withdrawn and pensive almost overnight. The loving attentiveness I had come to rely on waned as his focus shifted to urgently securing a well-paying job and vehicle here, seeming anxious and discouraged when his stellar European credentials turned out to mean very little to American employers in our rural town. I tried gently broaching the subject and boosting his spirits however I could, reassuring him it was likely just a cultural adjustment period and initial stress of fully integrating into this new life. I was confident we would get through this difficult period together. But the conversational silences between us over dinner and on drives rapidly stretched longer and more strained as weeks passed, no matter how I tried re-engaging him. Our previously passionate love life halted entirely at his seeming disinterest now. Even my most earnest romantic attempts to hold or kiss him were shrugged off or met with sighs of annoyance. His formerly endearing jokes about us going together to visit his childhood hometown and introducing me to his relatives overseas soon evolved to carry a foreboding, urgent edge I didn't understand when I tried changing topics. It all came crashing down unexpectedly one mundane weekday evening when I returned home from my part-time job to find Victor and most of his personal belongings already gone from our house with no note or explanation left behind. I tried his phone frantically, only to find it disconnected with no forwarding information. Even his social media accounts had all been abruptly deleted in my absence. It was as if he had disappeared from existence itself within mere hours. Initially, I filed a panicked missing person report with the local police out of desperation, but they found no signs of foul play and no substantive leads, instead speculating after a few days that he had likely voluntarily fled for personal reasons. For weeks, I sank into a dark depression, blaming myself and my potential failings as a wife and partner for why Victor had vanished so abruptly. Surely, I must have done something very wrong or off-putting to drive away the man I loved without even a goodbye. But with time and perspective in my heart, I came to understand the painful yet undeniable truth. Victor had just been coldly using me all along with the singular goal of eventually gaining citizenship and residency status in the idealized country truly longed for deep down. I had simply been a pawn that enabled him to buy himself several more years of legal time here than his status as a foreign student would have allowed. And I had fallen foolishly for his calculated ruse and false promises, against my better logic and judgment. The depth of his deception and performance skills stabbed painfully at my core when I let the fog of denial lift. Victor knew I had grown up dreaming of one day finding my one true partner to build a storybook life with forever. And he had purposefully weaponized that knowledge against me over years, constructing such an elaborate illusion of intimacy and requited love that I never felt the need to consider anything deeper happening below the glossy surface. I realized his flawlessly delivered act must have required immense patience and commitment, seamlessly accompanying me to every holiday and major family event without cracking character, constantly reassuring me selflessly in the face of every challenge or fight, staging the perfect thoughtful proposal complete with my dream ring, all to eventually achieve the ultimate end goal, the necessary legal documents and unrestricted freedom to remain in his promised land of choice. I would just collateral damage in this scheme, the unfortunate trusting pawn used and sacrificed to enable his dream. In hindsight, I really should have trusted my initial gut instincts when my overly eager friend Becca kept insisting I would hit it off instantly with her new co-worker Kaya if we just went on one blind date together. But against my better judgment, I reluctantly agreed to Becca's relentless setup requests only to find myself trapped for hours across from the single worst, most nightmare-worthy date I'd ever had. It was a sobering reminder to always listen to internal red flags popping up early and speak up firmly, rather than ignore issues hoping they'll resolve themselves. For weeks ahead of time, Becca talked up this woman Kaya she worked with, selling her as an artsy intellectual too, super sweet once you got to know her, with such quirky offbeat interests just like mine. While completely blind dates were far outside my comfort zone in general, I finally caved to Becca's pleas to just give her cool friend a single chance. After all, what could really go that horribly on a quick first date anyway? Famous last words. We had arranged to meet up at a cozy little Italian restaurant that Saturday night. I made sure to arrive about ten minutes early, already feeling anxious and smoothing my tide nervously outside the host's stand while watching the door. Right on time, I saw a woman who looked vaguely like Kaya's photos walk in and look around. 
My first impression was honestly that she had used rather misleadingly flattering pictures on her dating profile, the real life can and notably less put together. But I gritted my teeth behind a closed mouth smile as she approached, reminding myself that looks weren't everything and to keep an open mind. Attempted conversation was stilted and painfully awkward from the very start as we sat down and perused the menus. I now grasped why Becca had thought we'd instantly click. Kaya was clearly also obsessed with spouting teased recited trivia about super niche medieval history facts and artifacts, just like I admittedly was prone to do when nervous. But hearing the same tired fun facts and figures from her on endless repeat quickly became teased instead of the unique intellectual bonding experience Becca had envisioned for us. Things rapidly went further downhill once the waiter came over to politely take our order. Kaya interrupted him multiple times to rudely cut him off mid-sentence, complain about the length of wait so far, and bro begin over the accepted pronunciation of Prashe, which she insisted on butchering herself. I flashed the poor server an intensely apologetic look as Kaya continued muttering complaints under her breath about the lousy service and incompetent staff at this second-rate establishment. So much for her supposedly being a total sweetheart right off the bat. The remainder of the excruciating date only got progressively worse from there. Kaina proceeded to noisily chow down on her pasta like a ravenous animal when the food arrived, seemingly oblivious to the loud smacking of her gum and grotesque slurping sounds she made between giant bites. I averted my gaze down awkwardly toward my own plate, which I was now just pushing the contents around of, having utterly lost my appetite. Her jarring, unladylike burps and lack of basic manners at the table thoroughly repulsed me. My attempts to politely change topics of conversation were either met with stiff forward silence or grouchy accusations that I simply didn't get her death. By this point, I was fervently wishing for the ground to swallow me whole so the day could just end already. But how to make a gracious exit without coming off equally as rude or insensitive myself? In the end, the decision was made for me when the check was unceremoniously dropped off at our table. Without a second thought or glance in my direction, Kana wordlessly pushed it across to my side, clearly indicating she expected me to fully cover her half of the bill as well as tip. I begrudgingly threw down enough messy cash to cover the entire meal, now totally eager to escape this disaster scenario as quickly as humanly possible, her share covered or not. But my horror was far from over. Because outside on the sidewalk, as we finally left, Kayana insisted through demanding whispers that, as a real gentleman, I simply must buy her a lavish gift from a posh jewelry shop she had her eye on nearby. After all, she had so graciously blessed me with the honor of her valuable time and company tonight. By this point, I had reached my absolute limit. I politely but very firmly told Kayana that clearly, neither of us were exactly as advertised during our mutual friend's pre-glowing endorsement. And as such, I would definitely not be buying her anything extravagant after the nightmare of an evening we had both just unwillingly endured together. Her eyes flashed with indignant fury at my rejecting her bratty demands, and I could tell she was barely keeping herself restrained from causing a vile scene on the busy street full of departing dinner crowds. But after a tense moment, she abruptly pivoted on her garish designer heels and stormed off into the night without another word exchanged between us, much to my infinite relief. Of course, the date disaster still wasn't over quite yet, though. For weeks after, Toxic Ira texts and voice messages from her continued flooding my phone at all hours about what an insensitive cheapskate poser I was for not showering her with lavish gifts on day one. When I finally just blocked her number altogether, she then turned to harassing me via my social media accounts instead, pathetically calling me out by name publicly as a lame broke jerk undeserving of her precious time or attention. After the nightmare matchmaking experiment that was kinda, I made sure to start thoroughly screening and talking to any potential date prospects first over the phone myself before ever agreeing to meet up with them solo in person. When Jake so unexpectedly came into my formerly uneventful life, he seemed genuinely too good to be true at first. So attentive, outgoing, romantic, and seemingly ready to fully commit to me as his one and only. But of course, behind the doting, whirlwind boyfriend facade, he showed me lurked a calculating and wanted criminal whose web of lies finally caught up with him, shattering the idyllic domestic future together we had prematurely planned. 
We initially met and struck up conversation at a mutual acquaintance's lively downtown wedding reception after conveniently being seated together at the same table. The instant chemistry between us was palpable, leading to Jake whisking me onto the dance floor for most of the night, followed by a dizzyingly romantic goodbye kiss that left me positively dazzled. Then, only a couple days later, Jake unexpectedly showed up on my doorstep earnestly, asking me out properly on our official first date. Giant bouquet of flowers in hand and sweet confidence in towel. From that night forward, everything between us began moving at an exhilaratingly rapid pace. Within mere weeks of dating, we were officially exclusive. Jake lavished me with overwhelming amounts of flowers, gifts, public displays of affection, expensive weekend trips away, experiences I had only seen before in movies. I had honestly never felt so wholly adored and appreciated by any man I had dated before him. He seemed to almost worship the ground I walked on. Yet, in the more rational recesses of my mind, small but persistent questions and doubts would linger about who this mystery dream man truly was and where he had come from so suddenly. Jake never talked about or shown photos of his family, childhood memories, or the life he had before me. Any gentle mentions from me about his former career aspirations or past relationships were adroitly deflected and diverted back around to focus the attention onto me and us instead. But the intoxicating whirlwind romance seemingly dropped into my lap left me feeling far too swept up in the moment to pause it with pressing interrogations. I was convinced no ominous secrets could be lurking within such a seemingly perfect love story. Eventually, after some months exclusively together, I find him a handful of guys Jake referred to as his closest longtime friends that he had known for ages. Their familiar rapport and inside jokes with Jake seemed genuine, and they were able to casually confirm a few past minor tidbits about his life that he had directly mentioned to me previously. My slight lingering doubts were eased substantially, believing our accounts lined up enough. Surely whatever missing background details remained no longer mattered since what we shared in the present felt so right. I allowed myself to stop overanalyzing and waiting for the other shoe to drop. So after nearly a year total of dating blissfully, we decided to take the next big step and move into a place all our own. Accepting his elaborate, over-the-top public proposal made marriage feel like the natural obvious trajectory for us before too long. Jake had fully incorporated himself into every aspect of my daily life and routine seamlessly, I noted contentedly. His time, attention, and even bank accounts were evidently now completely devoted and committed solely to him. Those minor missing scattered breadcrumbs from earlier on ultimately ceased to bother me. I felt satisfied that everything added up properly. Until one otherwise entirely ordinary Tuesday morning, when there was an abrupt, loud, authoritative banging on our front door, jolting us both upright, followed by muffled shouts commanding us to open up immediately. Before I could even comprehend what was happening, a full SWAT team of armed police officers was flooding into our house with guns aimed squarely at a completely terrified-looking Jake. The scene quickly dissolved into mass chaos as they shouted his apparent real name, not Jake at all, and forcibly dragged him away from me in handcuffs, ignoring my hysterical pleas for someone to explain what was inexplicably unfolding. It was only once they had departed as swiftly as they came, taking my fiance away in handcuffs as a prisoner, that I noticed his entire side of the closet had been inexplicably emptied and cleared out at some recent point, and that the cell phone I had never seen him without now lay cracked and abandoned deliberately on the kitchen counter, like he had known this exact moment was imminent. In a fog of utter shock and disbelief, I quickly gave his photo to all local news stations alongside a desperate plea for any information related to bizarre events and his true identity. And that's when the entire sickening truth came pouring out over the airwaves that Jake was actually a very cunning wanted felon who had been living under a carefully crafted alias for many years now, after escaping incarceration and vanishing without a trace. Absolutely everything he had slowly fed me about his past family jobs, friends was all elaborately fabricated fiction to cover his dangerous tracks as a lifelong career criminal. My initial shell shock spiraled rapidly into white-hot anger as I fully processed the extent of his betrayal on every level. Jake, or whatever his real name was, clearly hadn't hesitated even for a second to make me his unwitting accomplice in crime, letting me believe wholeheartedly in building a future and one day having a family with a man who could never actually offer me anything real. 
I had been a useful pawn all along, room to win him yet more time off the grid before the inevitable day arrived when his lifelong illegal escapades finally caught back up with him. Picking through every corner of the home we once shared exposed his web of deception even further. I've uncovered stashes of cash, various prepaid burner phones, collections of intricate fake IDs and passports, police scanners, and other covert surveillance tools he had all been secretly utilizing to strategically lay low in recent years while simultaneously evading intensive search efforts related to the nationwide manhunt for his capture. Meanwhile, I was nothing more than his conveniently infatuated and doting future bride cover story, the perfect, stable image to avoid drawing any unwanted suspicion. The sheer scope of which I had been manipulated and deceived sparked intense rage to boil up inside. With Jake Ali as now rightly back in proper police custody at long last, it turned out his unassuming handsome face being splashed all over the evening news also brought forward a disturbing string of deceived ex-wives and girlfriends emerging from the woodworks across several states. Thanks for listening in. If you like these stories and want to hear more, then please subscribe and like and support this new channel. We have more stories for you to listen to.